we'll get started. Yeah. Larry, would you yeah, like sure. to just say hello? Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Larry Gould. I'm with Advice Mortgage. I know some of you have worked with some of you, and it's a pleasure to meet those of you that I haven't met yet, and uh, hopefully some that you work with. Uh, I could tell you about my mortgage rates and the programs, but that would put you to sleep before we even start. Yeah, so I'm just going to tell you why I'm motivated and why I love what I do. I've been a mortgage veteran for 20 years. And I absolutely love it. I'm not from here. I'm from England originally. Yes, it's a shocker. One person thought I was from New York. Seriously. I think he was high. But um, I just want to let you know that the, re the reason I do what I do, and I was challenged to figure this out uh, by a business coach I had a few years ago. And he said, you've got to give me three answers, but neither of them can have anything to do with money. And I thought I'd go, well, the reason number one is money. Number two is money. Number three is money. So it got me to really thinking about what I do. And if you haven't done this, it's a great exercise. So I really bore in for a few days thinking about this. I had a week to come up with an answer. And I realized there are things that I really like to do about this business, which is very similar to what you do. You drink from the same well. And that is, I love to help people. And as somebody that came from another country, I absolutely love America. Absolutely love this country. Don't listen to what the media tells you. It's a wonderful country. Mm. And, um, and I get to be, I get the privilege of helping people buy a home. And my passion is first time home buyers. It's a tough crowd right now because of the environment we're in, which Jim is going to talk about. Uh, but it is truly an honor and a privilege to help people uh, because I view the home as a cornerstone of their financial wealth for the future. More importantly, it's, it's a sanctuary for their children, their families, a place where they create memories and provide sanctu a sanctuary from the harshness of this world. And we are living in crazy times for sure. So that's why I do what I do. And that compels me to be as good as I can at what I do. Uh, hopefully we'll get some a chance to work together, but I'm really happy to bring along Jim and Nick, this is going to be the best cr uh, credits you ever obtained. It's not like listening to regulations and codes and ethics. I'll let Jim take it from here. So Thank I'm you. going to follow up Larry's comments with a story that will give you the, a little bit of the background of the information we're going to uh, talk about today. Okay. So firstly, this is not going to be an FHA 203K class. So I, I just want you to know that as we start. I'm not going to try to teach you renovation loans. That's not the object here. The object is to give you some tools that will help you get more listings and will help you help more buyers. So for me, the application of renovation lending solutions began in 1988. Uh, I originated my first FHA 203K loan in 1988. I've been in the mortgage business since I got out of college in 1971. So I've been in the business more than 10 minutes. So uh, in 1988, I managed an uh, office for a little company here in New Jersey. And one day my brother calls me up. And my brother's an attorney. He owned a couple of properties. He says, Jim, uh, I sold that property in Newark to a lady. And you got to get her a mortgage. So, so I knew I was in trouble immediately because I knew the property. It was a two family in Newark and it was in bad condition, right? So I, I was with a company and uh, someone at that company had actually told me that there was such an animal as 203K and you could close as is. That's really all I knew about it at the time. So I knew that's what we were gonna need to help get the financing on that property, okay? So I'm gonna make a very long story short. Uh, it took us six months to get to the closing table, right? So whose fault was that, of course? It was mine. So, um, so that's not the story. The story is about four or five months later, I get a telephone call and you know, it was 1988, so I get this pink slip says the lady's on the phone, she wants to talk to you. So I'm figuring immediately I'm going to take a beating for something else because it took six months to close, no one's happy. So uh, I answer the phone and the lady says, Jim, uh, I just really felt like I needed to call you to thank you because my daughters now have a safe place to do their homework. 
And I'm going, what the heck happened here? I have a lot of kids, so, which we don't have time to talk about. <laughs> so, um, so I said, I don't understand really what happened because it took so long. And it, so I made a decision that I wanted to do more of that on purpose rather than by accident. So I read all the books, read the handbooks, read the mortgagee letters, read the 203K was originally written in 1962. Nobody ever used it really until the 90s. So in 1989, I started a mortgage company called K Mortgage here in New Jersey. Now, it doesn't look like anybody here really may, you might be old enough, but uh, <laughs> to remember that, but I started K Mortgage in New Jersey in 1989. And from 1989 to 1997, we were one of the top five 203K lenders in the United States. Uh, at the time, the program was being rewritten at HUD and a guy named Ken Crandall called the five largest lenders in the country and formed a, 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 an advisory group. It was called the 203K Lenders Work Group. I was one of the lenders. So we rewrote the program. So ever since, we've been students of the renovation lending products. So that's kind of the background and that's where I found something like what Larry described, that lady telling me that it helped her children. I wanted to do more of it on purpose and that's exactly what we have accomplished. So it's been a long time and we've developed a business model specific to just renovation loans and what we have now done is our team has gotten together and said, okay, let's take a look at this thing. So what, what are the best practices that we have seen by our referral partners as they list these properties and how can we help enhance that? And what are the best practices in the sale to the home buyer and how can we enhance that? So what I hope to bring you today is some good practical information that will help you build your business a little bit and build your business in listings of older homes, build your business in the outreach you might do to young families that are trying to find homes, okay? So we came up with Fixer Upper Agent. That's what we're gonna talk about, okay? So again, this is not gonna be an FHA 203K class where we're gonna spend all of our time talking about eligible properties and eligible borrowers and what you can and can't do. We're gonna spend a little bit of time touching on those things, but frankly, that's our job to uh, achieve for you. What we wanna help you understand is preparation. You know, anytime anybody says fixer upper, you start off with a little bit of fear, right? So let's see if we can't insulate that fear a little bit and repl replace it with some preparation, okay? So that's where we're going. I hope you find it a little more interesting than a three-hour ethics class. So uh, we'll give you some action steps at the end. We'll, we'll give you some good practical information. And again, it's about getting more listings and helping more buyers, okay? So here's where we're going to go. These are our objectives for the next few hours. We're going to try to uncover more inventory opportunities and just sell more homes. If using this information, you can sell two or three more houses this year, we're okay, right? Yep. Okay. Older homes, you know, this is about perception, this first point. The perception of renovation loans, FHA 203K, Fannie Mae Homestyle, Freddie Mac Choice Renovation. The perception is crappy house, bad borrower, you never get closed on time, right? The perceptions are, are those things. That's, it's just not correct when you have the right preparation and recipe. Older homes, homes that need updates or repairs, not just vacant, abandoned, kids been throwing stones through the windows houses for five years, but any home that needs any kind of work, update or repairs, Bank REO, of course, often those are not the properties that buyers find in their dreams, and they tend to pass them by. With a clear vision and the right process, these properties can become affordable. 
with the right preparation, they can become affordable opportunities. <clears throat> you can capture more listings by showing best practice marketing techniques, a little different strategy to those sellers that are on the fence. And we're gonna detail that. Show more affordable opportunities to your buyers and close more sales on time with the right process steps. Like anything else, there's a recipe. We need to follow a good recipe, a good process. Find more buyers who can buy. Often you're qualified buyers. Now, all of you, if you've been doing this for a little while, you got some qualified buyers, right? You got you 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 have that list that you're that you're dripping on your and they and they haven't decided to pull the trigger yet, right? Qualified buyers fail to find the perfect home they've been dreaming of at a price point they can afford. How many of you have buyers in that category right now? Most of you. Then, because they get stuck in the first scene of Property Brothers for six months, become discouraged and drop off the face of the earth, right? Help buyers see affordable homes that may need a coat of paint or a new roof. Or maybe that new kitchen. Or you always have people go in and say, I can move that wall and I can remodel it, right? But then they go, where's the money coming from, right? So you have to come up with solutions and the way to get to a solution is get prepared ahead of time. Develop and demonstrate more home ownership opportunities. Review the buyer's goals and highlight highest and best use of potential properties to reach the desired objectives, convert dreams into reality plans. Help buyers recognize the opportunity to build equity. I'm, I'm gonna show you the, the, the actual mathematics behind that. And I can tell you, after doing this for 30 some years, we watch our pipeline and we watch the results all the time. And the average equity buildup on any property, fixer upper, any property that, that somebody buys and then does some work to, the average equity buildup is about 17%. That's a big number, okay? So let's, let's look at some information. Let's find out what opportunity we're really talking about here. If you look at information from realtor.com, the national inventory of active listings declined. These numbers are a little bit old. I'll show you some, but you know what's happening to inventory, right? It's in the dumpster. There's nothing. Newly listed homes are down, way down. The November national median list price for active list, this number is almost, it is actually $499,999 today. Nationally, the typical home spent 47 days on the market. That's down to what, 28? Okay, N none of that is good news <coughs> for you guys, right? So you're in that every day. These are just visuals of the same information. Listing counts, newly listed homes, and it all comes from realtor.com. If you look at more inventory, more uh, data, Altos Research is a great place to go. I don't know if you guys go to Altos, but if you don't, you should. Great information, great visuals, great explanations from a guy named Mike Sorensen. He does a weekly podcast showing a lot of this information, tracking it on a weekly basis, and they bring it out week by week instead of waiting for the last month's data, so it's very relevant information. This information is active inventory and projected single family. You can see the inventory levels in years back to 2016, where we were sort of in normal business, right? And then you can see where the uh, pandemic hit and you can see where we are now and what the projections are. Yes, inventory is projected to increase, but not dramatically, right? So we gotta come up with solutions. There's the problem. What's the solution? It's not foreclosures. A lot of people think, here's one of the solutions for uh, the inventory problem. There's, there, we, we've had forbearance. Forbearance is now over. We've had all those houses in forbearance. Some people think that that huge wave of forbearance issues is going to flow right into foreclosures, and that's going to create more bank-owned inventory. That's not happening. 
It's not happening. If you look at the foreclosures at the end of last year, yes, they increased slightly, but when you go from zero to one, that's not a big help, is it? And if you drill down on that previous <laughs> graph a little bit, you can see where it's just a, a few houses. Okay, so since the moratorium lifted, we've seen market increases in total filings and starts, but in perspective, it's still a very low amount of foreclosures. This is not going to give you any magic solution to those people that you have that are qualified that are looking for homes. This is not the magic place you're going to find them. You might find a couple. You might. But I would recommend you not spend a whole lot of time because if you look at where the inventory of REO comes from, it comes from delinquencies, right? That's where the, that's where the flow starts that ends with a bank owned property. It starts with somebody who's delinquent. The delinquencies right now are at a 20 year low. That's not going to create a big inventory of foreclosed properties. It's really just that simple. They're going to be out there. There's going to be some of them. That's great. But it's not a place that you're going to be able to find any magic at all. Make sense? Just from the data? You need to know this because there are some buyers that are kind of come to you that say, okay, I know there's deals in REO property. Go get me one. <clears throat> you need to have the information of that. That might not be where we find your solution. So let's, let's just keep moving. Is it new construction? Not really. God bless contractors, right? They're working as hard as they can work, but they have supply line issues. They have material price issues. They have labor issues. There's all kinds of problems, right? There are some numbers that are coming out to say the year over year increases are really looking good. But when you go, again, when you go from zero to one or two, yeah, that's a year over year, 200% change, but that's not helping you. And when you remember that by decade, in this past decade, we only built 5.8 million houses where the previous decade levels were up here. We've been under building for a decade. To catch up to that with the problems that they experience today, it's going to take a little while, right? It is just going to take a little while. This is also not going to be the magic. There's no magic here. You're going to find a couple, but this is not going to be a magic source of a lot more inventory. Realtor.com's 2022 forecast, existing median sales price appreciation. The forecast for the year is 2.9%. What do you think has happened to that forecast so far? It's a little higher, right? Last year, obviously, it was much higher. This year, that's the forecast. It's running stronger than that, right? It's not going to be 12, 14, 16% again at the end of this year, according to the best minds that do the forecast, but it is going to be a lot higher than three. Existing home sales, not going to change a whole lot. Existing home for sale inventory, this is, this is not good news, right? Mortgage rates, what happened to that number too? That's changed a little bit, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at some detail around that. It looks like the, the most dramatic changes may be behind us. It's going to continue to go up a little bit, but maybe we've seen the peaks. Single family home housing starts. Home ownership rate, okay? There's not, again, there's not a lot there that you can be really too optimistic about. But we are where we are. The, the, the people in this room can change this, but we can change a little bit of our methods. We can change a little bit of what we do every day. If you keep doing the same thing you've been doing without changing things once in a while, you get stuck. Months of inventory, you know, it's a seller's market. It's going to continue to be a seller's market for quite some time, right? It's not going to go over that 
six months supply level anytime soon. Actually, today it's 1.7, I think. Does that sound right? Realtor.com, again, the housing forecast for 2020. A whirlwind year for buyers is ahead. It looks like it's going to be pretty much true, right? Whirlwind maybe in a lot of different ways. Suburbs, still the place to be. The pandemic continues to shift what Americans look for in a home. There's a lot of people who want to get out of New York and live at the Jersey Shore. A lot of them. Millennials are ready to make moves. 45 million in the, in the millennial home buying sector is very healthy. We'll look at demand in a minute. And it's going to continue to be healthy. We need to understand that market, understand what they're looking for, understand their needs and their problems, and we need to give them solutions. They're, they're, they're in that tranche of people that are forming their households. They're just starting their families. They want to stabilize their housing costs. There's a lot of things that create some urgency in that buyer population. Affordability remains a challenge, that's for sure, right? Sales prices, interest rates, affordability remains a challenge. Things are not unaffordable, but they're a little less affordable than when the interest rate was two and three quarters, right? Home price sets records, rents outpace home prices. That's not a good option, renting. Mortgage rates are on the rise. Home sales reach 16 year highs. More homes hit the for sale market. I don't see that just yet. A growing group of buyers, uh, Hispanics make up a large share of the market comprising more than one out of 10 recent home buyers. That's a market we need to pay attention to. We have an office in uh, Point Pleasant and they do home buyer seminars and their Spanish speaking classes have twice the students as the English speaking classes. It's pretty interesting to watch. I think this is a very interesting report if you if you haven't looked at it. The 2021 Home Buyers and Sellers Generational Trends Report from the National Association of Realtors. I picked out the chapter that I was most interested in. This is chapter two, the characteristics of homes purchased. So this is what I'm what I want you to absorb here is opportunity. Okay? This is this is all about let's figure out where fixer uppers fit into the uh, marketplace and where we can create more opportunity with that market. So new and previously owned homes purchased by uh, age groups, okay? New and previously owned homes. If you look at that millennial market, right? They're only buying a couple of new homes. They're buying previously owned homes for the basic majority of the people that get to buy. You know that, right? That this data bears out those facts. Price of home purchased, information by age of home buyer. Again, if you look at that millennial population, in what price range are they buying? You look at the bigger numbers, right? You're looking at the 200, 250, up to $400,000. Those are the price ranges that they're buying, which tells you those are the price ranges that they can afford, right? <coughs> Your home built. This is where it comes into the information that, that we've been watching for 30 years. The age of the home buyer by the year of, uh, or the age of the home. Again, the millennial buyer population, the biggest population of buyers, look at where the larger percentages are. 1980, uh, 1959 through 1980. These are old houses. These are old roofs. These are old heaters, kitchens, bathrooms. These are older homes. They're buying them. Those homes are available. People don't put all the pieces of the puzzle together, I think, so that it can become a recipe to get to home ownership. Characteristics of home on which the buyer compromised. 
Okay? So when you, when you get into that process, what are the things that you're going to compromise on? Of course, you're going to negotiate the price of the home, which is the, the, the top item. But it's surprising. The second thing you're going to compromise on is the condition of the home. Everybody isn't, you know, even though they're dreaming about it, they're going to compromise on the condition of that home. Even though they're dreaming about perfection, they're willing to accept less if, it, if they're prepared for that. Size of the home, style of the home, we can't change lot size with renovation solutions. But you can, you can poke into those first three problems if you have the right solution. Realities of buyer fatigue. You guys know this way better than we do, right? When you talk to those buyers that you have pre-approved, their fatigue is caused by that record price appreciation. Extremely low inventory. Record high percent of sales price over list price. The competition. All those offers. Record low days on the market. Historically low mortgage rates. And, and I want you to keep... Keep that in perspective, okay? We're going to look at a chart a little later that will help you do that. Historically low rates. Well, what does every headline about interest rates say right now? They're going up. I was a loan officer in Virginia Beach, Virginia <laughs> in uh, September 1981. 19%. 17 and a half. Yeah. 17 and a half percent. It was amazing. <clears throat> people are still buying houses. People still need houses. People need a place to live. You know? they got to have a place to live. We were selling the FHA, you remember the 245? It's a graduated payment mortgage, right? Negative amortization. The start rate, the start rate was 14 and a half. It's incredible. We had builders building as fast as they could, really. Because there were so many people that really wanted to buy, right? They're building all, and they're paying in advance six, seven, eight points into the deal to buy down the rate. It was amazing. It was amazing. You know, every time I stop and think about it, that takes my breath away. <laughs> Homes are less affordable. They're not unaffordable. Don't let somebody think, oh, my God, I can't afford this because the interest rate went up in eight. <laughs> oh, time out. Relax. Think about that for a minute. Yes, it's a little less affordable, but it has not become unaffordable. You good? Yes. There we go. Front row. Yep. I'm going to ask you all the questions. Done. <laughs> Know. This is the Housing Affordability Index way back to uh, 1990, okay? Now, it, it's, it, you should note when somebody looks at this, yes, housing affordability is less than at its peak, but affordability was at its peak after 2008 because of the glut of discounted bank-owned property. Okay, so that, that's real, That's a false factor. The affordability now, in comparison to other normal markets, is in really good shape. Even though the interest rates have gone up, even though the sales prices have gone up, the affordability factors are still in pretty good shape. Okay? 30-year fixed rate mortgage, again, this information from Altos. You can look back uh, to January 2012. You know, this this is a pretty long time, back to 2012. That's 10 years, right? In the last 10 years, we've been in good shape on interest rates. In the last 10 years. And we have not gotten out of that range. And yes, it's going to go up a little bit further. Some people are saying it's going to hit five. Maybe a little bit more. Well, you know what? That's still a pretty decent range, right? And you need to be prepared to have that conversation with your home buyers before they, they tell you they're going to turn around and walk away. You're in a pretty good place still, right? 
So here's the perspective slide. Keep this in perspective. And we tell our own people this every day because we have loan officers who have been around 10 minutes and they're thinking interest rates are going up. I'm never going to be able to sell another loan, right? Well, look where we are right here. This is where we have come from in the last 30 years. If you do a straight line analysis of interest rates, it's been down the whole time. It's still down. Yes, it's going to go up a little bit further, but it's still over here, not over there. The sky is not falling. Interest rates are still reasonable. And I am going to give this, uh, this deck to Larry so you guys will be, you know, we're happy to share this stuff with you. Okay? So, uh, and, and we tell our, our people all the time, I don't know where you keep, you got to keep this on your phone, keep it on your laptop print it and keep it in your briefcase because when you have that conversation with a home buyer share their perspective with them not just today's headline you got to dig behind the headlines to get some good data to talk about with someone to give them good counsel and that's what they're looking to you for you don't want to be here right i mean if you just compare the two perspectives a little bit which one do you want more information about I want more information about this I don't want more information about how high my rents gonna be three years from now this is reality this is what people are worried about we need to give them good counsel on the the, the viability of buying a home the stabilization of their housing costs and how they're going to make money. You know, I, I don't know whether you go, uh, MBS Highway has uh, a lot of great information and they have uh, calculators. One of them is called the cost of waiting calculator on that website. And you can plug in market data, you can plug in the, the scenario that you're looking at. That when, you have, when you're talking to a, a, a young family, that's worried about the headline of interest rates, worried about the headline of sales prices are just unrelenting. And I'm gonna wait. You know, I'm gonna go ahead and take my vacation and, I, and I'll call you in six months, or I'm, I'm gonna wait and see what happens next year. Okay? Well, what's gonna happen next year? Somebody else is gonna make the equity uh -huh build up on that house instead of you because we're still going to be appreciating the appreciation is not going to stop appreciation is going to continue at a lesser rate and next year you could be looking at five percent instead of four or four and a quarter so just do the math if you wait you lose money if you go ahead and make the decision now, get prepared to make the decision now, you're going to take advantage of the opportunity today. Impediments to purchase. So what are some of the items that make somebody turn around and walk away, right? So what's getting in the way of making a home purchase? First time home buyers, all buyers, haven't found a house yet that meets my needs. Doesn't have that gourmet kitchen I'm looking for, right? Doesn't have that third bathroom I need because I got two sets of twins. Can't find a good house in my budget range. It seems like where everybody is, right? Yeah. So, so what are we going to do about that? When you have your, you know, we, we talked about the list, your list of qualified buyers, right? Mm -hmm. So you take them out to find their dream home because you've been having these great conversations. It's a good one, right? So you've been having these great conversations about, you know, here's what I want in a house and the kitchen and a fireplace in the family room and, you know, a, a, a finished uh, basement and, you know, a, a really nice garage because I have a, an old car that I like, right? So you're having the dream home conversation with people so, and, 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 you're, and you're developing that you're looking at all the, the scoop, not all the lists, the limited number of listings that are available, and you're going to take them out to take a look, right? So you find the dream home. This has got all the bells and whistles 
that they had on, I don't know whether you fill out a little form anymore these days or, or what it is, but this has all the bells and whistles they've been talking to you about. This is the house they've been dreaming about. What happens? It's too, exactly. Too much money. Or there's it's, a bidding war on it. It's too much money. There's a bidding war. The open house has the line around the block. So you're going to get 35 offers tonight, right? So where's your where, where your your young family going to end up with that? Nowhere. Looking. Right. Looking. They're going to keep looking, right? So exactly right. So you're going to keep looking, and now you've learned dream house, too much money. All right. So so now we're going to look for something you can afford. What happens? This is not the dream house. No, that's more like my house. It's not. The, <laughs> This is not the dream house, but this is one they can afford, right? But you know, you got masonry steps, and you got iron railings, and you got ch pick, chipped paint. You have jealousy windows. You got a roof that's probably about got a year left. Uh, so you got issues. Mm -hmm. So what happens? You can invest the cash. Yourself. <laughs> Where's the money coming from, right? Because well, I'm going to buy the house. And then I got all this stuff to do. Yeah. They're not prepared. Mm -hmm. They're just not prepared. The first problem is, where's the money coming from? So I would say to you, in, and those are real circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. The dream house you can't afford. The old house you don't want. So I would say, let's skate to where the puck's going to be. Because that's where you're going to be. Mm -hmm. You're going to be looking at houses they didn't describe in their dream form. So let's skate to where the puck's going to be and help them get prepared. It just makes a lot of sense. Take the fear out of the deal. Mm -hmm. And the time to do that, there's two times, yeah. in my view. One, when you're going out to older homes to list them, mm -hmm. the time to prepare is before you go to the listing appointment. And be prepared to have more available than the other five people that are gonna follow you in the door. Mm -hmm. Two, with your buyer, before you take them out to look at houses, just have these conversations. You know, here's your budget, here's what's going on in the marketplace, if I can show you an older home that's in the, in, the, in the neighborhood you want to be in, down the street from your uncle, down the street from the elementary school, but it doesn't have the gourmet kitchen, if we can come up with a plan to get that in there for you, would you be willing to look at an older home? What's the answer going to be? Yeah. Yes, of course. Right before that initial conversation. Just that small part begins to get them prepared, okay? So, buyers looking at that, it's a great house. It is a great house, I love it. It's a great house. It's very <laughs> sentimental. But if you're, if you're taking somebody to this house, right, you, you gotta get past parking on the street and looking at it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you've done that maybe with your in initial conversation, but when you walk into the kitchen, now what happens? Nothing. Your buyer turns around and walks away quietly. <laughs> right. You're not cooking Thanksgiving dinner in there, ever. Right? But if we gave them some help, if we replace the fear with preparation, we could get them to think about this, wow. right? Same house. Mm -hmm. And we could get them to think about that kitchen. And if you just help them with that vision, <clears throat> you move past the fear, right? Jim, You're not allowed to ask questions. I'm not going to ask a question. Oh. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Uh, actually, it's a really interesting story. I've tried to connect you with a realtor on this. At the last presentation we did together last week, the realtor called me afterwards and said, Larry, I can't believe she, their house was her first listing, her first listing mm -hmm. 
the buyer that bought it bought it with a two or three K loan. It was yep. her buyer. Yep. <laughs> they since sold their house, made a profit on it, bought another house yep. using a renovation loan, yep. the Fannie Mae one. Yep. And now they're selling. She's been in the business ten years. That's about ten years old. That listing, by the way. Yeah. That um, now they're moving, leaving New Jersey, going to Florida. Common story. Doing the same thing in Florida. They're completely sold it. They're using it as a way to build up their financial wealth as they go through the houses. So the moral of the story is, right? Mm -hmm. If we can help people be prepared for this transaction, it changes their life. Absolutely. Right? It changes their life. Changes their life. Yes, sir. How do you get people past the issue of the time? You know, they're paying rent or like living in a house and they've got to spend four months. Okay. Eight months, 14 months. Sure. House, it takes forever. It's a great question. So what do people do about their budget for those initial months? Because, and I'll show you the detail of this a little bit later, a uh, uh, renovation lending solution is a fully funded loan. You're borrowing the sales price and the renovation funds. Closing on that fully funded loan, you got to start making payments while you can't move into the house. So this gentleman's question is, what do I do? Because I'm, I'm still paying rent, how am I gonna make that mortgage payment? There's an option in all renovation loans that you can finance in the debt service mm -hmm. during the construction period mm -hmm. so that the payments are made literally automatically, okay? So, so there is that consideration, there is that conversation when we get started with them, mm -hmm. you know, what, what and again, I'll talk about this later, but when you do these transactions, you need to make sure whoever you do them with, and, and, and by the way, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be, um, uh, I'm not supposed to be biased today, neutral, right? right? I'm supposed to be neutral because this is a CE class, right? So I'm going to say to you, whoever you use, you got to make sure there's experts in the deal. <laughs> And I can tell you that he has experts, and one of them's me. We have a half a dozen people that support our sales teams because the conversation starts right away with an expert about here's the terms and conditions, but here's all the features and benefits. And one of those features and benefits is as we're talking through your budgeting for those first six months or four where you might not be in there, we can finance those payments if you need. If you're, if you're not living at home in your dad's basement, you might need to go ahead and have a source, for, right? So we have those conversations with people to help complete their preparation. Yes, sir. Well, the next question is, of course, nobody wants to deal with this. And I think everybody's afraid of renovations. And they just, you, mean you have two, a couple with a child or two, and have two jobs. Mm -hmm. they're just, they don't want to deal. What do you say to them? Because their problem is what? That they have too many kids? <laughs> they don't have any time to deal with the renovation. That, right. That's the that, that we immediately tell everyone, you got to get a good contractor. Right. Yeah. The contractor has to run the job, not the homeowner. Yeah. For this reason, most homeowners have no idea what's going on. Right? So our counsel about that has to start right away as well. Yeah. And I'll, sh I'll show you, that has to be, by the way, when we get to the buyer side of this, part of your initial conversations, okay? Ma'am? So I, um, I am working with buyers who, you know, we have to resort to this solution. But my question is, Sure. Do you, I also work with investors, so, but the buyers who want to, do you pre-qualify them for that or they have to have the house first before you, you pre-qualify them? That's a really good question. I want you to hang the on to that is of a, of a because, in this case. Yep, in a few minutes, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take you through the mathematics okay. of this, okay? okay? The mathematics of financing a fixer-upper will okay. answer your question. Okay. But I want you to remember that question. Okay. Okay. It's very important. Everybody get the idea here? Yep. Yes, ma'am. So, does this have to be only for primary residents or can people use loans for secondary residents? Okay. So, no and yes. No, it doesn't have to be primary because there are also solutions for investors and second home buyers. Okay. 
So it really is, this is not your father's 203K. I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. This is conventional and government renovation solutions. Okay? There's eight different programs. Most lenders don't tell you that, though. But there's eight different programs. Okay? Now, here's, here's the part that Larry described in this transaction that is characteristics of all of these transactions. This property was actually purchased at $150,000. The renovations were 50, so the guy's in for 200, right? The market value on the appraisal in the transaction was $250,000. Our, our guy who bought this made $50,000 at the closing table. I'm sorry, I'm going to do what I did at home for HDT. Sure. There's no way in hell that costs $50,000. No, 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 not today. That's for sure. You're absolutely right. It's a couple okay. years old. I would I would only ask you to, uh, those numbers are proportional. Okay. Right? You're not going to buy it for 150 today either, are you? No, no I wasn't. Right. But even 50. So the numbers are proportional. Yes, sir. One thing I don't really understand is, like, whenever you, like, look at what can I get back from redoing my kitchen, mm -hmm. the answer is, like, 80% or 75%. Oh, my man, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you asked that. And I'm going to ask you to keep that one, too. All right. Okay? Because uh, that really goes to what kind of advice are you giving the seller? All right? Yeah, yeah. The seller. Keep that in mind, okay. and we'll, we're going to get to that specifically. But to get, to get this loan, you're going to have to comp the after rehab value to the market. Right? That's you're correct. The you're, bank up going, is... you're seeing in my neighborhood houses, to finish them, to gut them anyway, yep. that, maybe that's not good. But to gut them, it comes in overvalued. For sure. So, um, so let me say a couple of things. One, yes, we're looking at the after improved value. The appraiser's assignment... Mm -hmm is to review the plans mm -hmm. for renovations. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to you about the process that we put okay. that together. But the appraiser's assignment is to give make the hypothetical assumption that the property has been improved yeah. by the plans and specifications provided for him. All right? Yeah. So we send him regular appraisal assignment plus the plans for what's going to happen is uh, responsibility is to comp it to other updated properties, right? So we do get the after improved value. Sometimes, and I'll, and I'll say to you, about a year ago, I was worried about appraisals maybe on coming in. But we haven't seen that many that have come in short on renovations. after the renovations, huh? right? Some that have, have, have been short slightly, one of the programs, the FHA 203K, actually allows us, and I'm going to kind of give this to you quickly in a little more detail later, but the FHA 203K allows us to go to 110% of the market value if the costs are greater than the market value. We are able to go to 110% of the market value to calculate the loan. So we go to the 110 it's not... And if a lender stands in front of you and says you can go to 110% loan to value on 203K, they're wrong. We're able to go to 110% of market value to calculate the loan. Mm -hmm. That 110% can be the maximum mortgage basis to calculate the 96.5%, which means your actual max loan to value can be 106.4, mm -hmm. roughly. So that's amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right, because the loans you're getting are a very low down payment loan, so if you only yes. have twenty percent or fifteen percent, you got that cash too, but you don't have to apply to them. You don't have to put down. You get more cash to rent up too, because you're not doing twenty percent down. On Correct on all of the above. Yeah. Yes, you can get them for very low down. Yes, you can put more down payment if you want to. If somebody says, I want to pay for all the renovations myself, well, that really actually becomes a greater down payment because the lender's required to, to finance the escrow with a complete project. Yeah. So it can't be, I'm buying as is, and my bank account's going to fund the next six months. Can't do that. 
Okay. But if you're willing to put twenty or thirty thousand dollars into the deal, yes, you could leave those. I could be assigned them. Just make that a um, larger yes, down payment. Same. Sorry, thank you. Okay. Your bottom line's the same, right? So again, looking at where's our opportunity? Older properties make up the overwhelming majority of the marketplace. Sellers are listing, and buyers are looking at properties that need updating. So what's the detail there? Well, in Monmouth County, New Jersey, this is from the Census Bureau. In Monmouth County, New Jersey, 86.5% of the property is 30 years old or older. Mm -hmm. All right? So that's kind of a majority. 60% of the property is 50 years old or older. Those are the properties that you're listing and people are going to be looking at. We need to do a better job of preparing them. If you do list a property that's like really old and I don't know, it's an estate sale and maybe it has been vacant for a while and you list it as is or cash only, right? And we see listings like that all the time, cash only, right? Why is it cash only? Because of its condition and you think that the only guy that can close is the guy that's got the cash. Who's got that much cash? If you, if you look at the data around who's got that much cash, obviously it's the higher income earners, right? And, and the highest level they give you is $200,000 today. That probably needs to be 400. Mm -hmm. It's probably about five or 7% of the population. So who's your potential buying population if you list as is or cash only? Nobody. Cousin Louie, if you're lucky enough to know him and call him up to buy the house, God bless you, right? How many of you know Cousin Louie? Right. So there's, there isn't a potential buying population, generally speaking, for older homes that are listed cash only. But if we're able to give them a renovation financing solution, how does that change your potential buying population? It changes the population to 74%, roughly. And most importantly, remember the millennials we were talking about? This, these are the income levels of those millennial professionals, right? Look, look, that's where your potential buying population is. And more important than the dollars and cents, who's got a greater urgency to buy? My wife's pregnant, we're having twins, I gotta buy a house. My rent's going up another 7% next year, I gotta buy a house. They have an urgency to buy. They wanna buy. We need to prepare them, get rid of the fear of looking at an older home, get ready to buy a fixer-upper and make it your dream home. Household formations in the millennial population right? Mm -hmm. It's just reality. That's mm -hmm. where it is. Mm -hmm. That's where the home buyers are, the millennial population. Demand is unrelenting. Again, this is Altos information. This is, again, tell, another thing that tells us demand is unrelenting. Mm -hmm. This is weekly new inventory single family residential. It's a study of the immediate sales of all listings. The immediate sales look at it's about 30% of all sales are sold right away. Somebody's buying them right away. There are buyers who will buy immediately. The demand is unrelenting. We need to do more to get them more properties. What do millennials want in a home? What is it that they talk to you? What are they dreaming about? This is what some surveys tell us large master bedrooms, right? They want, they want a big bedroom. They want a garage, two-car garage. They want solar. You can add solar into a renovation project. They want a luxury kitchen. How many houses that were built in 1945 or 50 have a luxury kitchen? Well, some of them because they were updated. Right. Others do not. They just don't. It's still orange countertops and avocado appliances, right? Those are the things that they're looking for. These are things we can help them with 
even if that particular house doesn't happen just yet. So, to review, when you take a qualified buyer to find their dream home, what do you find? You find the dream home and you find price tags. Right. Too much money. Priced out. When you look for something they can afford, not only do you not find what they have been dreaming of visually, which we could prepare them for, but you find the questions of where's the money coming from? Okay? It's all about that preparation. So, buyers looking at this need more help seeing the having the vision to see the opportunity for affordable home ownership. <clears throat> right? We got to help them right in here to start thinking about what they can accomplish so they can find affordability and find some of that equity. So let's, let's talk about these bullets because this is, and, and what I'll tell you is, um, oh, is it 1030 already? It sure is. Jeez. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm, I think I, I have two more slides to show you and we'll take a break. Does that sound right on the time? Yeah. That's, okay. That's what, mm -hmm. what these are the peripheral benefits of all renovation solutions, okay? Now remember, this isn't about a specific program. This isn't about FHA 203K. This is about solutions. This is about helping your buyers find solutions to what they're looking for, right? Fixer upper opportunities give any qualified buyer, any qualified buyer, at any income level, don't don't mistake this for some bond program that you gotta fit the guy's income into a window. An affordable solution to buy homes that are discounted because of their age, condition, or status. Okay, it's 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 again not just that foreclosed property or or estate home that kids have been throwing stones through the windows for a couple of years. Doesn't have to be vacant doesn't have to be damaged and need repair. But if it's an older home, just needs updates, that fits. As a matter of fact, it fits better. With a renovation loan, home buyers can borrow both purchase money and renovation funds in a single mortgage loan. And they can close as is. Okay? As is. Doesn't matter. I've done scrapers where you go into Irvington or Newark or somewhere and it's a burned out crack house. Somebody shoves it off the foundation and you build a new house. All of those things. Close as is. Down payment can be as little as 3%. Okay? 3% is the Fannie Mae Home Style, Freddie Mac Choice Renovation, First Time Home Buyer Programs. You got to fit into the county income levels, but it's three percent down on the conventional loans. Okay. You made this work on uh, on uh, up teardowns. Pardon me. You said scrapers. You made this work on teardowns. Yes. So don't do teardowns. You got to keep the foundation. Yeah. You build over the foundation. That can only be owner occupied. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the loan amount is based on the after improved value of the property. This is not, and there's the, I love this line. This is not just your father's FHA 203K. There is a complete line of government and conventional renovation loans. Fannie Mae Home Style, Home Ready with Renovation, that's the 3% down. Fix It Investor is our Home Style Investor Loan. FHA 203K, 203K Limited, and I'm going to take a minute to talk about the difference. Fix it jumbo, we have a jumbo loan, it goes a million dollars, we've gotten it up to a million four. Freddie Mac Choice Renovation, Choice Reno Express, actually allows the home buyer to use Home Depot or Lowe's as their contractor for some simple kind of projects. It's all of those programs. It's not one box. And, and our business model uh, has a process 
where we'd do a pre-approval. Anybody can do a pre-approval, right? Any lender can do a pre-approval in 10 minutes. But we also put together a plan to improve. So it's more than just that pre-approval. There's more to it that helps us get to the right program. We don't pick the program at the pre-approval. He's not going to approve somebody for a 203K. He's going to approve somebody, same as usual, for five hundred thousand dollars. Yes, ma'am. When you say plan to improve, do you have uh -huh. uh, an architect involved in this? Good question. No. When I say pre-approval with a plan to improve, it's just that initial mindset. It's that initial. If you go out and find a house that needs a new kitchen then here are some of the things we need to do. The inspection, pick a contractor. We're going to begin to have those conversations. We're going to get somebody at the mindset that they can begin to develop the vision of that new kitchen, as an example. Which is okay? the points. I mean, you're going to have to have an inspection. You're going to have to have... Yep. I'm going to tell you all about that. The, yeah. There is a process to it. Process. But the process, and, and again, it's like any other recipe. The more you get practice with the timing and the quantities, if you will, the better you get at cooking the meal. So we've had 30 years practice, made a lot of mistakes by the way, but learned by them so that we get in with the right inspections, we get in with the right counsel about where am I going to find a contractor, we get in with the right process and milestones so we can close on time. Our average turnaround time from app to closing is 43 and a half days. It's not 60, it's not 90 or 120, it's 43 and a half, even with the additional process. And the reason that that is successful is because we run simultaneous swim lanes, right? So mortgage companies, you know, you do your pre-approval, you take your application, you're running your credit file, and you do your, your appraisal, right? So during that same period of time where we're running the credit file, we're getting the right inspection, putting together the plan for improvements, getting the appraisal, we're running all of those things at exactly the same time. We're not waiting for that one and going to this one, okay? Is it, is it reasonable to assume that because they're fixer uppers, you probably have more time to do all of this? Just because the houses are not as hot in the market, they're not moving conditions, so they're harder to sell, so you have a little more time flexibility to put these things together. To, to than, in, than in the super hot. Part. You mean your contingency period to get to the closing, or do you yeah. mean getting the project done? Yeah, yeah, to, get, to, to, to buy it, to close it, you know, because if, if I was selling a house to somebody and needed a a government renovation loan, I'd be concerned, um, but I see how you alleviate that concern by prepackaging it. You yes. Know, this is how we do it with Denver before. Absolutely. Yeah. We actually have a uh, pre approval letter. Uh, you know, we got standard pre approval letter, it shows you the program. We put an addendum with it that says this is a Fannie Mae home style. We're going to close as is. We're loaning this borrower the purchase money and the renovation funds, and we're going to close as is. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So the biggest hurdle is getting over the understanding that you're going to not need a CO. Because often people will tell us, hey, wait, you can't do that. Oh. Yes, you can. Well, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Transfer a title. Right. Yeah. Right. We're just transferring the title. Mm -hmm. We're not, the guy's not moving in yet. Yeah. We don't need a CO. No CO to close. No temporary CO. No CO inspection required no co to close so so what what that tells you a couple of things one any property where you're worried about getting that co this is the right program right any property where you think that the appraiser is going to go in and i don't know he's going to make a list of 10 different things and come up with a cost to cure of about twenty five thousand dollars what does that do to your deal no co to close any property, any condition, any neighborhood, any qualified buyer. Okay? The repairs or improvements are done after the loan is closed. The close as is on time. At closing, the seller is paid 
and an escrow is established for the homeowner to fund the improvements. She doesn't believe no see other clothes. I no, 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 I don't. <laughs> I, 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 um, I feel like, didn't we do an open house years ago? And we, I think we put together something like this. And mm -hmm. I had a fixer upper house. Quite, I can't remember specifically, but quite likely. Uh, yeah, quite so, likely. you know, if you have a listing and you, you want to do an open house, this would be a great opportunity to bring Larry with you so he can explain this type of loan Thank to, you. to potential people coming into. We actually have a counter display, which, which is what you may be remembering. Yeah, we have a like folder, goes on the kitchen really counter. Good. Right? Yeah. So it's a, it's the orange countertop I talked about. So on the kitchen counter, we got a folder, and the folder in, just simply has pretty pictures of a new kitchen. And on the other side, it says purchase plus renovation funds available. The object of that collateral piece is for the people that are coming through to say, hey, I need more information. Because that gives you the chance to have a sales conversation, right? Instead of the guy turning around and walking away quietly, I need more information, kind of gets you into the conversation. And I will say, and I'm going to show you that, but uh, I would also say to you that same folder, you should take to a listing appointment. Because at a listing appointment, you know, the, the, uh, you know somebody like myself that's 73 years old, I'm thinking about moving to Florida, I'm going to leave the I Love Lucy kitchen just like it is. Are you thinking of selling? <laughs> no, <laughs> I got too many kids. So, uh, so I'm going to leave it just like it is. And I know that somebody's going to come in and hate my kitchen. I don't care. Well, if you come in with, that's okay. I'm going to put this on the counter so somebody's going to love the space and they're going to understand that I'm going to help them make your home their own. You've just done more than the other listing agent coming in at five o'clock. I just wish I knew this when I bought my house. Yeah. Well, there you go. I have a question. Mm -hmm. You can do it with a refi too. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's say the house is in good condition, but it's dated, and okay. it's on the market for 800000 Okay. Do you still give this type of? Yes. Oh. Because maybe you, you had twins uh, a couple of months ago, <laughs> and you need more bedrooms. Okay, so it's a Cape Cod, and you can do a shed dormer on the back, put in those bedrooms real quick. Yes, you can do that. All right, excellent. Yeah. But uh, well, another question. You didn't have twins. No, I don't have twins. But <laughs> I have 10 years apart, and they look like 10. People there you think go. They're twins. Um, let's say there's a house for $250,000 mm -hmm. on the market. looks like this house that needs fixing. Mm -hmm. I have the first time home buyer competing with the investor who comes with cash. Yes. I, and, and I... I'm going through this because I work with investors all the time and I know lots of these things. Yep. So do they put, uh, do we put more offer and, and then come to you? Like, you know, I can, I can look at the value of the home and I know when this home is uh, sure. renovated, how much it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, I praise that. Mm -hmm. So let's say we offer 300,000 and then I come to you for a renovation mortgage and mm -hmm. the house needs fifty thousand mm dollars -hmm. or more i mean i i just i want to know how the equation works like maybe it needs seventy thousand dollars to be fixed and and the sale price is three hundred thousand so how do you how do you approve the mortgage in this way <laughs> here's the math thank okay. you very much did everybody everybody get that great segue okay <laughs> everybody got it is all about the mathematics okay okay yeah. so I'm gonna show you the mathematics we're gonna we're gonna run we're just gonna keep going you guys okay with we just keep going anybody needs to take a break we can do that can I go get coffee <laughs> you want to take five minutes ten minutes yeah you want to take a break yeah okay